If you want a war I'll bring it on Watch as the walls of your city fall It's beautiful So guys, I decided to um, do things a little bit different. Uh, we've been in the series of 1 John, as you know of, uh, but I decided to do a different um, sermon for today, and uh, I want you to open up your Bibles, if we could, to um, Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. I titled it Battle Weapons, um, because I've been, I've been working on this sermon, I kid you not, for over a year now. Um, this is something that God has really pressed in my heart when I was doing Windshape and I was over um, in other states. He just kind of laid this on my heart and I've been working on it ever since then. Um, and I really think it's impacted my life and some things that God has revealed to me that I felt I should um, share with you guys. But um, before we do that, I always like to start before we go into the word with a word of prayer because I just really want God to um, have his way in the service and do whatever he feels is necessary for um, lives to be changed. So if you will, let's bow our heads before we get into the word. Uh, Father God, we thank you for today, God. We thank you for your word. We thank you that we are about to read your word. And God, I just want to ask that our ears be open. I want to ask that we can be um, able to pull something away from your word. That's not just a, another time where we come together and we just get to uh, read a book, but it's the, it's the living, breathing word of God. And Lord, I just want to ask that as we go into this and as we dive into it, that our hearts will be open, our ears will be open for changing um, some habits in our lives by the power of this word, and, to sh and that you would show that this word is just more than just a book, but it has power, and it is your word. Uh, we thank you, we love you, we praise you, and in your presence name we pray, amen. So if you would, um, I'm going to read Ephesians, starting at 6, and it's going to be uh, verses 10 through 18. And it says, finally, uh, the final word, be strong in the Lord and his, in his mighty power. Put on all God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. We, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor. So you will be able to resist the enemy in the times of evil. Then after the battle, after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground. Put on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For the shoes put on, bless you, um, for the shoes put on the peace that comes from God, from the good news. That you will be fully prepared. In addition to all these, put on the shield of faith to stop the flame. It's you just says flaming arrows. I don't know why it's different up there, but flaming arrows of the devil. And then finally, it says to put on salvation as your helmet of God and take word of the spirit or the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be presented in your prayers as all believers everywhere. So I remember as a kid, uh, I had this, I, had, I went to this like field trip and it was with this class and we went to like these little battlegrounds places. I don't know if you guys have ever been to that, but like they reenact like uh, big, huge battles that have happened in this time period in these certain places and they just felt like a reenactment. So I remember they brought out like this wooden sword and they had like this little 
like kind of stand where you come and buy some of the things if you wanted. And I remember as a kid, I had a little bit of spending money from doing chores. And I remember I was like, man, that sword is so cool. I was like, I want it. So I went over and I asked the, asked the man how much it was. He's like, he's like, it's $7. And I was like, oh, sweet. I'm eight. I get $8 in allowance. I got this. It's mine. So I give him the $8 and I take this little wooden sword home. And I'm telling you, man, I would practice every day with this sword. I would be outside going like, I was like, oh yeah, so if anyone breaks in our house, mom, I got it. I got this house locked down. Any person breaks in the house, I got it. They're going to be intimidated with me and holding this sword and be like, yeah, what's up? And I'm like, I got this, mom. Until one day, I started to practice more and my, my, my brother-in-law came and he was like, hey man, that's a cool sword, but hey, I want to show you something else. I want to show you something a little bit cooler than that. I was like, bro, <laughs> come on. This is my sword. I paid for my money. There ain't nothing cooler that you got. And he goes, he goes, oh, really? He's like, let me show you. And I kid you not, I go into his, I go into his room. He shows me, and he go, he reaches over his top dresser, and he pulls out this long, huge looking thing in a case that looks like a sword. And I was like, I was like, well, mine doesn't come in a case. And I was like, it's still, my sword is better. Let's just face it. He's just jealous. That's why he's boasting about his sword because he knows mine is better. And all of a sudden, he pulls it out, and it's a huge katana. And if you don't know what a katana is, it is a very, very sharp sword. And it's actually one that's uh, made, I think it's in made in Japan. I don't know if you're wrong about that. Don't check me on that. Um, but it's a very strong and it's a very, very sharp sword. And I remember looking at it and I got so fearful. I went from excited to then fearful because now I remembered that my sword had an element that his didn't. His was real. Mine was fake. Um... <laughs> So I was like, no, th no, that's, I don't want to touch it. He was like, no, just hold it. And I remember holding it and it was so heavy. And I was like, this is nothing like what I was used to. And it got me thinking, when I started thinking about that and, and reflecting on swords, maybe because I just like battle movies, I don't know. But I started reflecting on swords and I wonder if sometimes in our lives, the amount of times that we prepare in reading the Bible and the amount of times that we actually engage in the Word, I wonder if our soul, swords may look like my wooden one. It's dull. It's light. It's maybe not as strong as it should be. Maybe it's even not as intimidating uh, because we're not practicing and we're not, we're not spending time in learning and getting the Word in us. Um, as we said before, if you read in the Word, it said that the... God, the Word of God is literally the sword of the Spirit. What this is saying is that this is not just a book like I was saying before in my prayer. This isn't just a book, but that the Word of God is a living, breathing Word that He has sent people to write that He wanted Him to say. And it's made also for speaking things that we cannot see out of our lives or things to call into our lives, the things that we cannot see and call the unseen world or the spiritual realm. That is why it is called the sword of the spirit. It is called the sword of the spirit because I think and I'm very strong on this that it is made for battles that we come into spiritually. Um, what does that could look like? Well, I mean, spiritual battles could be a matter of many things. But one of the things I think a lot of times spiritual battles can be is you're suffering through depression. Sometimes I believe depression can just be a spiritual, like spiritual oppression is what I like to call it. In the sense that you just, you don't know where it's coming from. You just have these feelings and you're just like, man, I don't know where this is all coming from. It just came out of nowhere. And now I'm feeling, I'm feeling all depressed. I'm feeling guilt for things that I did a while back. I, I can't seem to find forgiveness. Even though I read the Bible and it says I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven. And as long as I try to live the right way, it's all good. But I still feel the guilt on my shoulders. And a lot of times I think it also can be... It can be simple things like this. Maybe you guys can apply to this. But it can be simple things of maybe shame. Maybe you're shameful with some of the things that you did. So it's hard for you to move forward into what God has for you because you keep living in your past. And that is something that I think Satan uses to throw in your face and distract you. But the question I wanted to ask you guys today is what are you coming at him with? What is the weapon that when he is coming after you, what are you throwing after him? See, a lot of times we, we like to let Satan have his little ways, but we have more power than you think we do. We have this book that tells you how to do things and how to attack the enemy when he is coming and he's approaching you. This was not just a book just because it's a book. It's not, I mean, if that was the, if that was the truth, I don't know why we would be here teaching out of this 
every single Wednesday and every single Sunday and all around the world, this book is impacting people's lives. And that's for a reason. It's because this book has power. This has, book has more power than you think it does. It has more power than we automatically just assume. It's just a book, but it's much, much more than that. It says even in the word itself, it is the sword of the spirit. It is meaning it is, has something so much more valuable than just some pages and some print. So what I wanted to present to you today is that I think that we need to, as Christians, be in this all the time, every day, for a reason, because it's preparing you for a spiritual battle. Now, a lot of times, what does that look like? I think that Satan comes after you in two different ways. He comes after you, just like I said, I think when you're hungry and you're tired. Why do I say that? It's because I will, and I will get to this later, but I believe Jesus was the person that's the perfect example of that when he goes and he's being tempted. He's tired, he is hungry, but he remains faithful to his fasting and his prayer. And he's remaining that way. But we'll get to that in a little bit because one of the things I wanted to elaborate on and what I want to show you is that we need to practice and make time for the word of God. And when when we are doing that, it is like sharpening our sword. Let me, let me just show you some things. Dakota, can you come and help me? Because I'm going to need somebody to help. I feel like a lot of times, your, your weapon of choice may look like this. Now, if I came, if Dakota comes after me or starts swinging that thing around at me, I'm not going to be very intimidated. I'm not intimidated now. And he's much bigger than I am. I'm not intimidated. Okay? But if you come at the Satan with one of these little things and you're just like, no! I have the power in Jesus' name! Go! Go! What? What good is that doing? It's no bad Satan. Bad, bad Satan. No, it's not doing anything. No, I'm too long. It's not doing anything. This is not because it's not intimidating. It's not strong. It's flexible. It's not going to hurt anybody. It's just going to. It's not going to hurt them. Now, when we spend time in prayer and we actually dive into it, and I start coming at someone with this, this is going to be a little bit more intimidating. Because it's sharp, even though this one's fake, but it's sharp. <laughs> Play along with me, people. We have imaginations, all right? It's the best we can do. All right, I was trying to look for real ones. But it's sharp. It's firm. It's intimidating. It is something intimidating, and it's used for battling. Who knew this is not an effective weapon going into your spiritual battle? You need a sword to go into your battles. If you're coming at Satan with something that's flexible and something that's not going to harm him, it's not going to intimidate him. But if you spend time in the Word, it's like you're sharpening your sword. It's like you're getting ready for when the moment comes, you have your weapon ready already in hand. Thank you, Dakota. You can throw it up. So, the sword, when they make them, they make sure to take time in molding it and making sure it has enough metal, and making sure that it's enough temperature, it's at the right temperature to actually melt the metal and to be able to craft it and do all these things because they want to make sure that it's firm for battle. When they used to make these, they did not make these just so that after one battle it's over. They made these to last for a lifetime. And that's why I believe the Word is with us because it is not something that's just here to last for a season, or it's not something that's just to last us for a day, or just something to get us through the week. It's something that's going to last for a lifetime. When you have this embedded in your heart, it lasts for a lifetime. I can tell you a verse that is embedded in my heart. It is Psalms 100. And it says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. He is merciful and gracious and dwells to all generations. And I have that in my, in my heart just because I had enough time studying it that I've actually memorized it to the point where ever I'm sad or I get into the moments of depression, I can quickly say, you know what? The Bible says to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. It doesn't say to make a wildly noise or to a more noise. It says to make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. And those are just commandments of things to go about life. This word is so much more than just a book. I don't know how to stretch it more. It is something that is life Changing, And I believe that is why this book will always be the number one bestseller. is because it is a life-changing book. Now, I want to get back to you when I talked about that. I believe Satan comes at you, like I said, when you are hungry 
and you are tired. Now, a lot of you might be theologically saying, well, Chris, that's Jesus was God. Duh. So he couldn't feel hunger and he couldn't feel all that stuff because he's God. Well, he was also 100% man, too. So that means everything that he felt on the cross would be everything you were feeling. That means every sadness that Jesus had was just like sadness you had. Every time he's cried, every time he prayed, he is still a man. We cannot separate God and, and his humanity. He is, they're all together, 100%. But I would like to show you, if you would like, I would like to show you a correct way to use a sword. If you want, I'm going to throw up on the screen Matthew 4. And I'm just going to show you what, what God has showed me and what's something that he was directing me in. So if you go to Matthew 4, it should be up there. This is called when Jesus is being tempted. All right? Just listen to this now. And I'm going to break it down, but listen to this. Then Jesus had led, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. Thereby the devil, for 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted and became very hungry. Jesus is already hungry. He's hungry. All right? Right there. He's hungry. All right? Now, let's continue reading. During that time, the devil came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, No, the scripture says, People do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth. And go to the next, next verses. So, then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, If you are the Son of God, jump off. For the scripture says, You will, in the order of angels, will protect you. And then they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even, they won't even hurt your feet on the stones. And Jesus responds, The scripture also says, you must not test the Lord thy God. Now pay attention to this last couple of verses. These are like one of my favorites. This is where Jesus just goes full on savage. He just keeps on throwing scripture out. I love it. That's something that I do in apologetics. Anyway, um, the next the next devil took him to the peak of the very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I will give it all to you, he said. If you will kneel down, kneel down and worship me. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him. For the scripture says, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And the devil went away and the angels came and took care of Jesus. Here's something I don't think you've realized. Satan knows scripture just as much as Jesus did. But what's the difference? What's the difference between how Satan was using Scripture and how Jesus used Scripture? Well, for first things, Jesus is actually using Scripture in the context it's written in. Now, you're probably asking, well, how do I read the Bible in its context? It's a whole thing. If you want to know, ask me, ask Pastor Hill, uh, Dakota and, or Hilton. They'll tell you how to read Scripture in context. It's very easy. And you don't have to go all freaking out about that. Just ask one of us. We'll show you how to do it. But here's, I, want to, I just want to point out something. Satan knows how to use Scripture. There will be moments in your life where you may hear things that sound like God, but are probably not God. You will hear things, or you will have people tell you who are Christians, who know Scripture, will tell you to do something that might not be the godliest thing to do. How do you determine what is the actual right motives and what are the wrong ones? It's simply, you have to read the Word. Anything you hear, whether it comes to a sermon, whether it comes to a teaching about the Bible, when it comes to anything, you reflect back to the Word. Any sermon I listen to, I make sure to point back to this Word and say, does it line up with what Scripture says about it? If it does, then guess what? It most likely, and I would say most likely meaning most of the time, it is correct. But you need, but I just want to show you that Jesus already knows how to fight in this battle. Jesus knows the word and is ready to use it. He's not hesitating to use it in a fight. He's not hesitating to whether he's going to, you know, just like, you know, give up this thing and say, you know what, I might want to turn these stones into uh, two loaves of bread because I am pretty hungry. No, he doesn't, he doesn't co cooperate. He doesn't compromise with Satan. He doesn't. 
He simply goes after him with what the scripture actually says. And I just want to tell you that there's going to be a moment in your life, because there's a moment that happens in my life, where Satan will come at you and say, yeah, you're no good. Yeah, look at you. Look at you preaching. You're just, you make full mistakes. You're just like everybody else. Why do you think that you're so holy than everybody? If they knew what you actually did behind closed doors, if they actually saw the way you act around school, you're not worthy. Don't make them tell you that you're loved. And then what you can say is that you sharpen your sword because you've been in this word. You can point back to him. Well, the Bible says that, you know, God will never forsake me and he's never, he will never leave me nor forsake me. So therefore, if God is never leave me for and forsake me, then I believe that God is with me now. Because it also says that, you know, I am a child of God and that God loves me and that he sent his one and only son to die for me. So therefore, if he was to send his one and only son to die for me, therefore all sins have now and all Christians have now no condemnation. But now I get to live in righteousness and I get to live and have a second chance because that's what Jesus was sent to do. And that's what his word says. But I think too often times what we do is we come into battle because we haven't been reading our word, because we haven't spent time in prayer, because we haven't really been reading the word for what it is. We're just like, oh, I did my diva. It was good. But I'm not being challenged in anything, but it was good. If you're not being challenged in it, then what's the point of reading it? This book is not just a book so you can read it and just be like, well, I did it for the day. That's going to fade so fast. I can tell you that from experience. If you just read it and just say, well, I did it for the day. I did my daily devotional. A daily devotional is a push to challenge. It's a daily devotional. It means it's to push you in a new area that you've never pushed in before. For an example, you could be reading a devotional on love, and maybe the first devotional it talks about loving your neighbor. And you're like, okay, cool. So I'm supposed to love my neighbor. But at the end of the devotion, it's supposed to be an application. What are you using to love your neighbor? What did you do that day to love your neighbor? That day is your focus. You're focusing on that one thing, love your neighbor. The next day, you're going to be talking about loving God. Now, what did you do to love God today? What did you do to make, did you make time for him? Did you pray? Did you do this? Did you do that? They're applications for a reason. And I, and I just see too many Christians, and I, and I don't mean to put anyone on the bus, and I'm maybe putting myself, because I used to do the person that I would come into a battle just thinking I have all the answers, but I haven't been sharpening my sword. I haven't been spending time in the Word. I haven't been reading it as it's supposed to. I've just been kind of saying, all right, God, tell me what you want me to read. Get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger. That's actually kind of funny. <laughs> okay. And I'd be like, cool. And then my professor will ask me, or some teacher will ask me that day when I was in school, he'd be like, so what did you read today? I'd be like, get rid of all bitterness and anger. That's what I read. And they'd be like, cool, you did it. And I feel like it's a bad habit. I feel like it's a bad habit sometimes we get in as Christians. I don't think we're supposed to just read the Bible and read a verse and say, well, that was it. I'll read tomorrow's. Apply it. Be ready and always prepared for when the moment happens that you are tempted from the moments that, because Jesus being tempted knows when to use scripture. He's being tempted to do three things. One is he's tempted to now solve his hunger so he's using it to solve his hunger because he's hungry. And Satan goes, turn the stones into bread. And he goes, nah, I'm good. He's like, the scripture says to uh, scripture says not to do that. So I'm good. Um, I know what the actual scripture says. Thanks, though. Second temptation comes. He goes, okay, okay, okay. How about you just, <laughs> I don't know where Satan was thinking. But he's like, how about you just jump off a cliff? Just, just jump off, Jesus. You'll be fine. Just do it. It's fine. Prayer, I look at that as pure pressure. Just do it. You'll be fine. Scripture says you'll be fine. So you'll be fine. And then Jesus says, mm -mm, Nope. I'm good. I know what Scripture says. I'm going to continue on. Third temptation, he goes, All right, Jesus, listen. I did everything else, all right? I'm going to give you this one last chance to get it right, all right? Look at that kingdom. I'll give it all to you. I'll give it everyone if you just bow down and worship me. And then Jesus goes, No, because I know what Scripture says. Don't compromise. Because you know what the word says about you. Whatever Satan tells about you, throw out your ear because you know what the word says about you. I want to see more of you guys on fire for Jesus because you know what this word says about you, not what your head is saying about you. I am so tired. I'm so tired of even just having, maybe it was just me, but I was so tired of having these emotions and these thoughts of just, I'm not good enough. I'm not, I'm not worth anything. When the scripture clearly says that is not true. 
You are worth something. You are a child of God. You are made in God's image. The only thing created in God's image is you. Look at scripture. It is the only thing God has made with his image. And he chose it to be with every single one of you. You have that. Angels don't even have that. Satan himself doesn't even have that. You do. That is so much more valuable. That is so much value in you. That is what makes you so much different from everything else. So, here's the two things I, I think we need to do. I think it's two steps. It's very easy. You can tell if you want to come up, you can. But I think there's two things we need to do. Two things to practice. The first one is obviously we need to know the word for itself and the battles that we may face. We need to know the word and know the battles we may face. The second thing is this. We also need to know how, I think it's how, yes, it's, we need to know how to put it in action. Guys, I don't, I don't know what you go through in, in your head, and that's fine. You don't have to tell us. That's fine. It's between you and God. I understand. Um, listen, I, I go through things just like you. I go through everyday emotions and everyday battles in my mind. I feel like me and my mind are always on a separate spectrum. I always feel like my heart wants to do one thing while my mind wants to do another. I've always felt that way. It's never been, uh, it's never been like on the same page. But what I choose to do is I don't choose to live in this sadness. I don't choose to live in this voice in my head telling me, you're no good. You'll always be sad. Look at your family history. You'll always be this way. No. One of my favorite verses in John says otherwise. For if the sun sets you free, you are free indeed. That is not a prosperity gospel. That is not something that you hear just because it's going to make you all oh, lollygagging and you're going to tickle you through the roses. No, but what it gives you is a sign of hope. If the Son sets you free, which He did on the cross, you are free indeed. End of story. The period is right after that. It's now with this and with that. The period is right after that. That has been tatted on my heart. And if we want to say literal, yes, I have a cross in my arm, but we throw that out the window, okay? That's not what I'm talking about. But I've adapted that scripture and studied it. I've studied even if it was just that one verse. If it was just that one verse, I wanted to put it in my heart so when ever I have a moment of sadness, if ever I have a moment of guilt or shame, I can say no because if the sun sets me free, I'm free indeed. Because I don't want, I don't want, I don't want to go into battle like this. I don't, no, no, I want to go to battle like this, that I know the word for what it says, and I've been studying it, and I've been ready for the moment to use it, and when to put it in action.